session is co-sponsored by a bunch of different groups, including the Academic Physician Section, the International Medical Graduate Session, uh, the Minority Affairs Section, the Medical Student Section, and the Women, Phys Women Physician Section. So we, uh, as the YPS, want to thank everybody for their support. First up would be our moderator, uh, Dr. Karthik Sivashankar, who is the Vice President of Equitable Health Systems in the Center for Health Equity at the American Medical Association and the Medical Director for Quality, Safety, and Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's a psychiatrist at Justice Resource Institute and serves as a faculty member at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. His work is focused on driving racial justice and equity in the healthcare arena by leveraging high performance quality and safety practices to <laughs> systematically make inequities visible and to address uh, and resolve them as an integral part of healthcare delivery. So thank you. Um, our panelists include Dr. Ricardo Correa, who is the program director for the Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Meta uh, Metabolism Fellowship, and the director for diversity for graduate medical education at the University of Arizona. He's also a staff clinician um, at the Phoenix VA Medical Center and faculty for the Creighton School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Correa has authored more than 75 papers in peer-reviewed journals in the area of medical education, endocrinology, and healthcare disparities. Next up, we have Dr. William A. McDade, who is the Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer leading the ACGME's internal and external diversity and inclusion activities. He, he focuses on national initiatives to diversify and include underrepresented groups throughout medical education continuum with the goal of providing physicians with the knowledge and skills to serve the American public in humanistic environments where clinicians, clinicians and patient well-being is being promoted. Dr. McDade came to the ACGME from the Oxner Health System in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he was the Executive Vice President and Chief Academic Officer. Prior to his appointment at Oxner, Dr. McDade was a Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at the University of Chicago, where he completed terms as Deputy Provost for Research and Minority Issues and served as Associate Dean for Multicultural Affairs at the Pritzker School of Medicine. And finally, Davey Ryan is a medical student at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry and serves on the AMA Medical Student Section's LGBTQI plus standing committee, is a former social justice officer at the Workman's Circle okay. in New York City. They have been involved in global and public health equity work for over a decade with specialized training with working with LGBTQ, Latinx and disabled communities. Since coming to Rochester, they have co-led the Jewish, disabled, and LGBT affinity groups at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry and created the Rainbow Book, which is the first ever guidebook for recruiting and retaining LGBT medical students in Rochester, which is now being used as a health equity template in medical schools across America. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Dr. Sivashankar. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and with all the esteemed panelists as well. Um, so I'll be just doing a real quick intro just to get the conversation started with some basic, very basic framing, and then uh, we'll really hand it over to uh, the discussants. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So just as mentioned, I'm Karthik Sivashankar. I'm a psychiatrist by trade and the vice, uh, vice president for equitable health systems uh, at the AMA. Also a medical director for quality, safety, and equity at Brigham Women's Hospital. I'm just going to start with a little bit of history context data, but really just the basic framing for today, just since, since we only have a few minutes. Um, and I want to start with this concept of equity being a zero-sum game. So there's this ingrained myth that equity is a little bit like a pie. And if I give a piece of my pie to someone else, that's less pie for me. And, and that just couldn't be more untrue. So I'm gonna give some non-healthcare examples first to really emphasize this point. So seatbelt legislation. This was originally designed for children, but over the years has saved over 300,000 lives, not just children, but also adults. I think we'd all agree that seatbelts are important for all of us. So once again, something that was designed for one group ends up being actually beneficial to all in-flight smoking ban was originally designed for flight attendants, but that has since dominoed over the years to smoking-free public spaces and an overall reduction in smoking since the 1960s. So something that was designed for one group to improve their health or well-being ultimately has actually led to improved health and well-being for everyone. And then bike lane legislation. So I'm not a bicyclist, but if you are, apparently there was a lot of pushback around this. And uh, what we found is that it actually not only improved 
uh, the rate of injuries for bicyclists, but also reduced injuries for pedestrians, led to improved retail sales, improved health and reduced greenhouse gas emissions, obviously. So once again, something that's designed for one group of people ends up being beneficial for all. And this is a cartoon that was really pre-COVID that I think brings us kind of full circle to healthcare. And COVID-19 has really illustrated both the systematic inequities that we've been you know, trying to deal with for hundreds of years. Um, COVID-19 has been a magnifying glass for that. But this cartoon, I think, highlights the point, which is that you see the sailor in the bottom left here, he's coughing, and then there's these folks up in the Cadillac insurance deck saying, yeah, he has no health care down there, but it doesn't affect us. And COVID-19, as we know by now, has differentially impacted Black, Brown, non-English speaking, other patient populations more than white privileged uh, patients and communities. Uh, not surprising at all. But what we've also seen is that what happens to our most historically disadvantaged or oppressed patients and communities absolutely trickles up to impact all of us. So this is really leading us to this, uh, this point here. Why lead with race and racism? Uh, that's the framework that I and, and others, um, many others in the space lead with. And, and why is that? So the, I'm going to be answering the inevitable question that comes up around, well, what about older people? What about the disabled? What about uh, people with disabilities? What about um, LGBTQ+, plus, et cetera? And the idea here is to lead with racism, never to the exclusion of other isms. And there's an important reason to do this, because historically, when we have not done this, when we have approached this work in a colorblind way, it has been extremely harmful and detrimental to communities of color who get left behind. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that we're trying to improve access to surgical radiation cancer treatment for all. So what do we usually do in healthcare? We might come together as a group, come up with a plan with letters and phone calls and a patient portal. And, and at the end of two years, we look at the data and we say, oops, I think we've missed our mark. We're mostly reaching white patients and patients of color, non-English speaking patients aren't well represented in the numbers. And we kind of just shake our heads. So what if we try to do the exact same thing, but now we lead with racism? So we're trying to improve access to surgical radiation cancer treatment with a focus on people of color, communities of color. While we might actually design a team that includes people of color, we might translate into multiple languages. We might include online and paper copies. We might do focus groups. We might get community feedback. And what's the outcome when we do that? So Nettie Code is a, is a famous community organizer, passed away a number of, uh, fairly recently, a few years ago. Um, and she looked at this exact problem in this exact way. She noticed there was an inequity in terms of black and white patients having access. And she approached it in the way that I just described, trying to improve care for, for the black population. And the outcome was actually that care got better for everybody not just for black patients, but for white patients too. And the point here is that when you design a system that's so reliable and so resilient that it works for our most historically oppressed patient populations, you can be guaranteed that it's gonna work for everyone else. So if you have a healthcare system that works for your patient of color, who's in a wheelchair, who's transgender, non-English speaking, if you have a system that's so robust and, and reliable that it works for that patient, it's most definitely gonna work for your VIP privileged white patients as well. So I'm gonna pause there uh, with that initial framing and, and really hand it back over to Matthew to, to hand it off to the discussants. Thank you so much um, for that kind of brief primer of a big uh, topic. Um, with that, we wanna open it up for some uh, shared experiences from our panelists. Um, we've asked our panelists to share their experience with structural inequities in medicine and how it's affected them as a uh, person first and a physician second and how they believe that it has uh, affected our profession. Um, so with that, I would open it up to you if Dr. McDade would like to, to take the lead. Thanks very much, Matt. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, so so when, when challenged with the idea of how structural racism actually impact me as a person. I'll go back to maybe almost 45 years ago. Um, and the issue was I wanted to see an ophthalmologist. I, my, I had difficulty with nearsightedness. And what I thought was true, because I'd actually been seeing this ophthalmologist for a very long time, is that um, you're supposed to pack your lunch and go there early and then wait all day long in order to see an ophthalmologist. 
And I thought it was unusual that, that people would expect that you go in at a certain time for your appointment and then get seen. And, and what I recognized later on is that because uh, my, my mother and father wanted me to see a particular ophthalmologist, an African-American, and there were so very few ophthalmologists, um, that was part of the, the cost you, you bore in order to, to see someone who you trusted, who was in your community and of your community in order for your eye care. And th this idea of having racially concordant care is really an, an important concept to minoritized communities. In part, it, it comes because we live in these, these, these historically created, um, segregated communities, which have really created subdomains or subsocieties that we experience in, in our own daily lives. And so if you think about the structural reason as to why Dr. Broadnecks was the only ophthalmologist that uh, we, we saw and that could serve us um, is in fact, because there's so few. And I was giving a talk to the American College of uh, Marion Academy of Dermatology last week. And one of the things that I appreciated after analyzing the data in graduate medical education on dermatologists is that the one reason I, I think that there are so few uh, dermatologists um, isn't the, the fact that their board scores uh, are exceedingly high and that there aren't so many uh, underrepresented minority individuals who have these high board scores. It is in fact that in the historically black colleges and, and universities that have affiliated medical schools, only one of the four actually has a program in ophthalmology. And it, when you look at the data even more carefully, it turns out that the programs that are at historically black colleges and university ha universities have a disproportionately large number, large percentage of those individuals who practice in that field. So on Wednesday of this week, I actually spoke to a group of uh, ophthalmologists in Chicago, and I recognized the same pattern, that there's only one historically black college and, uh, and university affiliated with a medical school that has uh, an ophthalmology program. And it really explains the paucity of ophthalmologists in part. Um, and, and so why is that? Um, I think in part, you have to go back to the Flexner era, in which we looked at the number of medical schools that train African Americans, for instance, and those numbers went from about 14 down to, to two over a very short period of time. And that's persisted. And when, when I started medical school back in 1980, uh, it turned out that half the black physicians in this country were trained at one of those, one of the two historically black medical schools at that time, Meharry and, uh, and Howard were the only two that had trained those, those physicians. So, so you ask yourself after you know, an exceedingly long period of time why things haven't gotten better. And it is because of some structural problems that are inherent in our educational process. And it, the, the, the reason that health disparities in part um, don't get better is because we don't have a workforce that's really committed to working in those underserved areas and, and taking care of those disadvantaged populations. And I think that's one of the things that we have to focus on as we go forward. Um, and, and the elimination of structural racism, I think we have to get people into non-historically black colleges and universities, that's for sure. It's everybody's job and everybody's work to do it. But I think we also have to look at that disproportionate impact that those programs have and ensure that those programs are successful going forward. I'll stop there and let the other panelists have a shot at this. Thanks, Matt. No, thank you. Um, next up, I would ask if Ricardo, Dr. Correa, if you wanted to give your perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Lacoyer. And uh, it was a real pleasure to see Dr. McDade here. So one of the uh, things that I, I wanted to bring is that uh, um, the, uh, perspective from two point of view. One is being a, a Latinx member, and the second one is being an international medical graduate that usually is not considered as, as, as a minority, but if we think about we represent 25% of the physician workforce, so that's considered as a minority. So let me start telling you about um, um, having the two, two hats and, and being a Latinx community member. Um, so one of the things is that uh, there is different cultures, and, 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 and then um, even among the Latinx, there's multiple cultures and, and it's not being seen like that. So um, personally, um, as uh, Dr. Magda mentioned his story, so, so something that happened in, in my case was uh, trying to find a pediatrician for, uh, for my kid that speaks Spanish. And in the different places that I have lived, even here in Phoenix, where 33% of the population is Latinx, 
uh, 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 there is very a lot of difficulties. So um, uh, there is a uh, few people that wants uh, uh, that that speak Spanish, a uh, few doctors that speak Spanish, and then uh, uh, to wait to the, the waiting time for to see one of them is approximately six months. So it has been very challenging. At the end of the day, we have to go to a, a, a non-Spanish speaking physician just because we, we needed to, to, to see uh, that kind of doctor. So imagine the population in, in, in our case, we uh, understand English and Spanish. So it was more a preference just because of the of my wife's uh, preference. But uh, imagine that the population that cannot, that do not speak Spanish, they do not speak English in a place like Phoenix, um, have to wait so long. So that's one of the things that I want to raise. Uh, personally, uh, something that affected me a lot was uh, coming from outside, I, English was not my first language, uh, and then having an uh, accent uh, that at the beginning was uh, really difficult. I have to overcome multiple uh, 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 mental problems because of that. And probably I am involved in so many things just to overcome my own fear of not speaking English just because I feel that uh, uh, I feel that trauma from the beginning. So I will tell you the story that when I was an intern, my first presentation, I was on overnight. I remember my first month of, of, of internship. I was overnight and I came to present in the morning to the team that was receiving this uh, new patient. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, I was nervous because of being first time presenting. The second thing is I just mentioned the I, I kind of thing, say this patient was coming from Cayo Hueso. I didn't understand that Cayo Hueso was Key West. Uh, it was not something that I, I should to learn. And, and, and I mentioned Cayo Hueso. And then at the end of the day, everybody started laughing at me. Uh, and then just the attending say, hey, is that Key West? And start laughing. And that's something that always is in my mind. Even I try to overcome that imposter syndrome that I can do better. Always that image the, of everybody in the team, everybody was, uh, uh, white from American white and, and everybody was laughing at me. And I didn't, at that time, I didn't realize that this was some kind of microaggression. Uh, but later on, uh, when I start understanding this, yes. So that affect uh, 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 my, uh, my initial uh, uh, career being here in the US. So I think that that was important just, just to bring out things that sometimes we think that are not important for people, but there's important uh, in that life. So, so um, the, that's one of the things. The second thing is that during the prior administration, we saw an increased amount of aggressiveness against speaking Spanish in public. So one of personal story, I was in the park with my kids and we were speaking Spanish because even my kids are bilingual. Well, we always make them speak Spanish at home. So uh, we were in the park speaking Spanish and then a person called and said, you are in America please speak English. And, you know, I personally was very hurt by this comment just because I wanted to teach my, 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 my um, kids another language. And on top of that, I, I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunities that the U.S. has given me to the point that I joined the Army Reserve to serve for the country. And that somebody approached to me and say that kind of things without knowing my background, it's, 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 it's very hard. So these are things that our patients are facing. This is just my experience, but I, uh, there are multiple experiences that there are your patient that comes with some chronic condition. And we know that chronic condition is, 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 is in part by the structural racism that exists. So as an endocrinologist, I know the higher level of cortisol causes multiple of these conditions. And many of these kind of things happen because of this smaller events that happen on that person's life and, uh, and, and this, uh, this, um, this just aggravated. Let me tell you a little bit about what we, we suffer so from being IMGs. So we know that there is uh, uh, less opportunities as an IMG to become, for example, chief residents in a position. And I suffered that event. Uh, even uh, in, in, in my program, I was doing so, so other things. I was, since my first year, I was starting to teach evidence-based medicine to medical students. I was very active teaching evidence-based medicine to the interns when I was a second year, not as a resident, but also as, um, uh, as, a, um, uh, as a person that wanted to teach. I was waking up early, I remember on Tuesday, 6.30 to go to this. Even if I was not in that rotation, I was just doing um, 
uh, uh, other rotations and uh, and but I wanted to commit with that to teach that evidence based medicine to the medical student program director and at the end. Uh, most that I wanted to be a chief resident, they never offered me the position, mainly one of the reasons was because of an IMG. Uh, uh, also, IMGs cannot uh, moonlight when they are on J-1 visa. And this is not so much for uh, residents, but for fellows that have the opportunity, but because of the visa uh, limitations, you cannot moonlight. And that affects sometimes the economy of this group. Uh, uh, other thing is when you apply for fellowships, you are limited to the fellowships that you can apply because you have a visa or, or one type of visa or another type of visa. So that is also some, some structural things that are happening in, in our programs that uh, limit and affect at the end the, the, way, the, the, the career of an IMG. The most important for me was applying for grants from the NIH. So my dream to come to the US was because I wanted to do more research. Uh, and that uh, translate that you have to have an, a grant application and, and something um, that uh, to, to continue in the physician scientist pathway. But the, it was a very limited opportunities that I got uh, when I graduated from fellowship to apply for this grant. And, and later on, I realized that really these grants, uh, the majority of them, except one from the NIH, uh, it's for uh, a permanent citizen, permanent residents or citizens. So visa that want to pursue a career as a physician scientist, it's uh, are very limited. So I will leave it like, like that. And then later on, we will talk about some patient experience. Thank you so much, Dr. Javier. No, thank you, uh, Ricardo, for sharing those very personal stories. We really appreciate it. Um, Davey, if you could unmute, um, we'd love to hear your perspective as well. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm a medical student. And I definitely think the biggest structural inequity for me, even just starting out in pre-med and going into medicine is that um, I identify as openly transgender, disabled. Um, neither of these are considered underrepresented in medicine um, by a lot of places. And that was a huge issue for me. Um, I didn't know groups that I could reach out to, people I could reach out to. I'm first generation in America, I'm Latinx as well. I didn't have like a set network in medicine to learn how to work through this process. And as a minority applicant, a lot of my advisors really weren't very convinced that I would get into medical school in the first place, given the statistics of who gets in. Um, given that my application is very focused, my, my history before medical school, my career was very focused on being LGBT, on being disabled and doing advocacy for those communities. Um, I had a lot of people ask me, well, you know, how is that gonna appeal to medical schools? Um, so for example, like at my medical school, um, which has since grown enormously, in terms of like the um, LGBT representation and support as well as disability representation and support. When I first went there, um, the LGBT affinity group consisted of two people in the entire school. Um, and there was a disability affinity group, but nobody knew about it. You had to ask about it, even if you were openly disabled, seeking accommodations. Um, now the system has changed so that actually the leaders of this affinity group get forwarded the information of anyone who in the application said that they wanted support. And we reach out to applicants and say like, hey, do you wanna meet someone with this identity in the school? How can we help you answer your questions? Um, that didn't exist when I was applying. And I had no idea what to look for in schools. I had no idea how to recognize if a school was trans friendly, if a school would offer the appropriate accommodations, um, if the teachers and the doctors and the students were even going to be uh, not just tolerant, but accepting, friendly, um, aware of the privilege and joy and uh, contributions being these minority identities can give to medicine. Um, there's no longitudinal mentorship that really existed. I mean, especially because people being openly trans or queer or disabled in medicine is relatively new, not that there haven't been people who are these identities throughout medicine, but being openly about it, engaging in it throughout your career is new it's very hard to find like a school dean who's trans and disabled, for example. Um, it's very hard to find a chief attending. It's hard to find people who have gone through the career path that I'm looking to go through um, and ask me, hey, what did you do? What was, what was it like for you? Um, a lot of people have told me like, oh, like this is great, you're a pioneer, which is very exciting. Um, but also, you know, I wish I wasn't quite so much a pioneer that there weren't some people before me. <laughs> um, you know, you wanna be in the middle zone of that. Um, so that was certainly, uh, I think the biggest example of structural inequity is just the lack of recognition of what queer and disabled applicants need um, and what they're lacking. 
Um, and another one of the issues that I think my school has since addressed as well is that there aren't a lot of uh, studies on this. So we know kind of anecdotally, these populations are underrepresented, but the demographics don't always record it. My school didn't record trans applicants or trans students until the year that I got in and I petitioned for it. Um, and so since then we have some statistics, but that's you know a couple of years. We need to build it up over time. It needs to be a national effort. Um, I think that a lot of minoritized students get this feeling. Uh, it's, it's a feeling of isolation. It's not necessarily a fact, but it's a feeling. And it can't be a fact until we have statistics and research to back it up. And that doesn't exist yet. Um, and I think moving forwards in my career as well, that will play a large role in applying to residency. I know like Dr. Correa was saying, like there are limited application possibilities if you hold certain identities. Um, and I certainly agree. Um, and I think especially like as a trans person, as a person with disabilities, where can I apply where I will just be physically safe? Um, which I think is a consideration a lot of people don't have to take when they apply to residency and don't think of other people taking. Um, where can I go that actually has education and training available for people who are working with not just trans and disabled patients, if they even have those, but with physicians, with coworkers? That was a huge issue too, in that in medical education, it's always talked about as the other. You know, we learn how to speak to a trans patient, but not a trans coworker. We learn how to speak to a disabled person, um, but not a disabled coworker. Um, and I certainly have like personal experiences I can share with that, but it's kind of unlimited with the, the wide array of identities and disabilities that people hold. Um, but like, for example, in my school with COVID, everyone is wearing a mask and I'm hard of hearing. Um, and there were no plans for that. You know, no one was given clear masks um, so that I could understand them. No one had training. They, they all knew how to kind of yell at old people <laughs> through the mask when they had a geriatric patient. But when they see someone like me showing up for rounds, you know, there was no thought of like, well, if we do rounds while running down the hallway or in a stairwell, um, this person way in the back who reads lips can't hear me. Um, so I think places that even are very well-meaning um, that want to be LGBT friendly, that want to be, um, you know, challenging uh, ableism, want to like are, are in favor of disability justice, there are a lot of things they don't think of just because they don't have people with those identities saying, hey, these are the things that have come up in my experience. Um, a lot of places may have resources to recruit, but not to retain. Um, and I think that has been a, a very big barrier as well in that I've noticed sometimes that it's easier to find places that say they're queer friendly, for example, and then I say, okay, well, do you have any queer people on staff? No. Do you have any official LGBT training? No. How many of your patients are queer? Oh, uh, we don't know. Probably not. <laughs> um, so it's so, so important to consider every element. It's got to be in recruitment. It's got to be in education. It's got to be in physician representation and patient representation. Um, and I think that it's just, we're not where we need to be at this moment, um, even though it is improving. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much for to each one of you guys for sharing those very personal stories. Um, I think that uh, we were going to hand it back off to Karthik to do a little bit of question and answer with um, our panelists. Right. Thank you so much, Bill, uh, Ricardo, and Davy. Really appreciated um, the the insights that you shared. And um, I, I do want to mention that. And thank you, Bill, for mentioning the Flexner report because I probably should have mentioned that. Which is, you know, AMA's role historically in causing harms. This is part of the strategic plan that we. Um, that we released as well. Uh, so AMA had a role in the Flexner Report and in the closing of historically black medical schools and, uh, and organized medicine and, and the AMA have been not always on the right side of social justice. I would actually say we've been on the wrong side of social justice for a long time. And I think the last 20 years have been in a very important pivot for us. Um, but it's important that we acknowledge the past harms we've caused if we're actually gonna do any healing. Um, so, Really appreciated your comments. I was taking notes. I would welcome folks in the audience if you have questions to just go ahead and start chatting them in. I'm assuming that's possible. I would love to hear what folks in the audience want to hear about. I'll start us off with one question. So all three of you in different ways were pointing to the lack of diverse providers that are available and the structural and historical roots to that. 
Um, and uh, I, I want to add on another layer, which is there's a lack of diverse providers and there, that there is segregation in healthcare. And I'm going to leave it as simple as that. I just want to see what, what your all's impressions are to that. And if, if you want me to elaborate, I, I can explain a bit more about what I mean. But maybe we can go in in order of the speakers, uh, Bill, Ricardo, Davey. Well, well, Karen, I think that's a, a, a fantastic an analogy. There's a book I just picked up yesterday um, called Black Butterfly, and it's written by a professor from Morgan State. Um, Lawrence, I want to say Johnson, let me make sure I got his name here right, uh, Lawrence Brown, a PhD at Morgan State. And, and really what it deals with is how we have, have become hyper-segregated, as William Julius Wilson described in the late 80s, um, but, but it's even worse than that. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost by design that this has happened in, in our major cities. And if you look at the top 40 major cities, um, and so many of them have hyper-segregated communities where populations of minoritized individuals are confined. And because of the trust issues that exist in our society in general, and there have been more played out in the last several years than, than in, in any time before in, in my lifetime since the 60s, it really shows that, that we listen to one another and that we are in these insular sort of silos that don't allow us to hear what the other person is saying and, and getting a different opinion. And I think that's part of the problem that, uh, that undermines the trust that we could have in society that we had um, prior to, to a certain time with respect to medicine. I mean, you have to trust your doctor. Lisa Cooper, Neil Poe, um, Tom Levine, so many other people, Janice Blanchard, have, have written about how trust, the trust relationship between a physician and patient is one of the primary things that allows us to have that social contract that we have as a profession with society. And when that trust is eroded because it's undermined by the, the, the distrust that occurs in all other facets of society, those social determinants of health or structural determinants of health that we talk about, it really doesn't allow you to then switch over and say, well, this guy's wearing a white coat, this lady's wearing a light, white coat, so she's going to be different. And, and we really haven't demonstrated ourselves as a profession to be that much different. And as you point out, Karthik, the role that the American Medical Association and local medical societies have with the exclusion of, of African-Americans, for instance, um, during the time, erodes the trust that you would otherwise have with the, the medical establishment as well. So I, I think that the trust aspect of who you, you, you see is really important. And what we see is that people would rather forego care than to go to a medical environment to be cared for by people who mistreat them, who discriminate against them, who speak badly or ill of them and to them, uh, and mistreat them and mishandle them. Um, I just saw a paper the other day about the mishandling of a rough handling of pregnant women uh, and their experiences as a function of race and ethnicity. So, so we see this across the board as minoritized communities, which is why I think that racial concordance is such an important factor. If you look at primary care medicine, if you're an African-American physician as a black physician, you have a chance, a 40 times, 40 fold greater chance of seeing a black patient than does a white physician. This concentration happens because physicians practice in underserved communities of their same, same race and ethnicity. When they move to different cities, they actually relocate into similar communities to the one that they left in the care of patients. And that's because of, of race conscious professionalism, of course, but it's also because maybe they've been excluded from practice areas where they would otherwise have an opportunity to practice were they not of a minoritized group. The, the other thing that happens with this trust issue is that if, if you don't trust the physician and you don't have physicians who are in your community, you don't go outside your community to get that care, you're going to represent a person who has failed health. And, and I think the health disparity elimination problem that we have cannot be fixed if we keep making physicians of the same race and ethnicity and, 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 that we, and gender that we have historically. And that's why I think representation is so important. That was a brilliant answer. I want to ask one follow-up question to that, and then I'm going to ask uh, Ricardo and Davey the same two questions um, to, to get their thoughts. Um, so so the, the racial concordance data is interesting, and um, I, I want to 
ask you a follow up to that, which is um, what's the responsibility or accountability of white providers to care for um, historically minoritized populations to provide high quality, safe, equitable care and to ensure that they're getting the best possible outcomes? Well, at ACGME, one of the things that we stress in the Clinical Learning Environment Review, the CLEAR program, is that, not, that, that all residents have to learn about the importance of health disparities and ed be educated their, their around. And, and then they all have to show, demonstrate that they're working on a clinical practice um, environment reduction with respect to healthcare disparities as part of what you expect people to do in a CLEAR program. Now, in fact, most institutions don't do this today. Um, the CLEAR program has been in effect about 10 years almost. Um, two years after the first year, they did their first review of, of data. And one of the lowest ranked um, areas of the healthcare quality pathway in, throughout all of CLEAR actually, what were uh, healthcare quality pathway five and six, which deal with the education on health disparities and then the, the execution of plans to reduce healthcare disparities in your own practice environment. So we have to learn, all residents have to learn how to look for health disparities. We have to be enabled with the data as, as uh, student Dr. Ron talked about. We, we have to be able to be empowered by that data so that we can look at our own practices and see where we could be implicitly uh, discriminating against patients in some sort of way and where our outcomes are different with respect to race and ethnicity. So, so I, I would say that that's where everybody comes into play because we're not going to manufacture enough black and brown and indigenous physicians over the next several years in order to reach this racial concordance parity that we've talked about. I mean, you recognize that in some specialties, African-Americans represent about one and a half percent of the, of the physicians in that group, whereas they represent about 13 percent in the general population. Latinx individuals, same, same, same story in certain specialties. And, and you wonder why care isn't equitably distributed. Well, that's in part the reason. Ricardo, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great, great answer. Yeah, thank you so much, Karthik. So, so I want to uh, continue the conversation on, on, on segregation and, and, and talking specifically how in the hospital and the academic settings looks like. If you look uh, from the, all the medical schools in the US, uh, basically 18 to 20 deans are black African-Americans and only the ones from Puerto Rico are Latinx deans. So we don't have any Native American dean at, at this point. So you, you can see there the problem starts. So there's a pipeline where we have good amount uh, in the outside from uh, starting from middle school, high school. And then when we go into the higher hierarchies in, in academic medicine, we see less and less and less and less. So that create a problem, something that uh, uh, just at the level of associate professors, uh, uh, Dr. T Tracy Henry uh, published that she was promoted to associate professor. And she said in, in her tweet, she mentioned that only 1.9% of uh, female black African-Americans are associate professor. So we have to see this is, this is a reality that is happening every day in our academic institutions. So what the institutions are, are doing to change this? Some of them has very structured um, each uh, mission and vision. And this is since last year um, that I think that we should not be reactive, more proactive, but we have been reactive of what events happened last year. More and more institutions are putting their DEI statement in everything that they do. But what it really is translated is that few things has happened. So they have a statement, they want to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion, but what else? What, what is your plan? It's, it's not just to put it in a statement. And, and this is what, what, uh, what some, so the majority of institutions has been doing. So this is not helping the problem. It's just continuing the problem with a now a statement that you want to prevent. So segregation occurs not just for patients, but also inside the same system. Uh, you can see what happened with certain groups uh, of minority physicians that they are always assigned to multiple tasks and what we call the minority task, uh, that they are assigned to this and then they continue. You, you join a division and because you are the not common one, then you are immediately assigned, oh, participate in the DEI committee, participate in this. I think that this will attract you because, you know, it's talking about Latinx communities and probably you're not interested in that. 
uh, but they assign to you and then you start building this kind of thing. And we need to stop that kind of things and learning how to stop it is important. Regarding your question on, on what we can do as an entire physician community and, and, and as, a, as a society, I think that we need to raise our voice. It doesn't matter race, gender, ethnicity that you have, we need to raise our, our voice in all of these issues. Uh, I feel very supportive when I come to these uh, meetings because I see how that there is a lot of people that are doing a good job. So we need to continue doing that in our and, and stimulate more people to do this kind of things, that, that raising the, the, the awareness of, of that. This happens sometimes not only in, um, in, 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 in a, in a setting, I, I want to tell you a story that happened, for example, with one of, uh, of my fellows. Uh, we were having, we were, she was having a, a patient and the patient uh, immediately started yelling in front of everybody in this waiting room and then in, in the room that she, that he only wants to see a white male physician and she was a um, Muslim female. Uh, and then she start, he started yelling that you are going to kill me, a um, million of other things. And this happened two years ago. We are not talking about 20, 30 years ago. This happened two years ago. So the positive of this negative thing was that everybody that was there from the MA to the nurses, to the physicians that were staffing this, uh, uh, that, that, that were there in the clinic, everybody stand up and just kick out the patient in a nice way outside the clinic and we banned the patient from coming to the clinic. So it was not just one person, there was a follow-up, everybody was calling the fellow, asking her how she was feeling days after, any support. They just provide a comfort zone for her for this event that happened that can affect her life. So this is the thing that we should start doing, raising our voice. If you're a medical student, you can raise your voice if you see that some, something is not correct with a nurse. If you are, uh, it's not just a person of authority or power, the ones that have to raise the voice. It's every level. Uh, and this is a culture that you want to create in your division, you want to create in your institution. And that's something that I was very proud to see how this end, because that raised the voice and we were a model for many other situations that happened in the hospital. So just because everybody stood up and didn't tolerate that this was happening with that. So that's something that is not for minorities, that's something for, that's for everybody to stand up when you see something that is wrong. And this is coming from the, 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 the militaries. So they say, when, when you hear something say something, the same thing should happen in DEI. When you hear something, just say something. And of course, the last thing is always support the uh, uh, minorities that you know uh, and, 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 and make them feel integrated. Don't make them feel that they are uh, separated from, from, from what they go and, and try to understand what is their situation and how can you help them. Uh, uh, if sometimes you hear a person that is very uh, uh, understanding of your situation, that that helped, that changed a lot in your, in your, in your career. Uh, my, my final example is um, I continue coming with AMA because here I found a family that was interested in my point of view, that was my interest in, and didn't uh, uh, judge me because of any of the reasons that I mentioned before. And that, and that they were fighting for things that I really like. So having that support stimulated me to continue in my career to continue being healthy and having a well-being. So, so I think that each of other, we, what we can do is just support persons that have that are coming from a minority background. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Davey, I'd love to hear your additions, thoughts. And there's some great questions coming in, so we will try to get at least one of them. Yeah, I mean, I think Dr. McDade and Dr. Correa have, have covered this wonderfully, so at the risk of repeating them. Um, I mean, I, I think that, as Dr. McDade said, the segregation of providers has to do with a lot of intersections of identities. I mean, there's class, there's race, there's gender, there's um, all of these things which contribute to certain areas having certain populations represented and uh, other areas not. And that's a really big issue for sure. Um, 
I mean, for example, for myself as a trans person, I think I would be very hesitant to go uh, to a rural community center um, to provide care. I would be scared. And are there initiatives that are recruiting these people and supporting them? Um, sometimes, but maybe not as much as we need. Um, I certainly think that there are a lot of doctors who have so much disdain for people who don't seek healthcare, maybe in the way that they think people should or want people to, or the way that their own family does. And a lot of this comes from not understanding the, the lack of trust that people rightfully have, marginalized communities rightfully have in the medical system. Um, I mean, when I guess your background comes from always having been cared for and provided for by doctors in a way that is respectful, in a way that really hears your issues, um, in a way that is safe, it's very hard to understand someone, for example, who is coming from a background of having had their uh, family members be forcibly sterilized or unknowingly sterilized, um, like has happened to a lot of people of color. People who, um, for example, Henrietta Lacks, who founded so much of the medicine we know and use today, had her cells stolen. Um, how can you go into an office knowing that your ancestors or even the generation above you or the generation with you have had their bodies disrespected um, and used by doctors in ways that they didn't know, that they didn't consent to. I mean, I think that to additionally have those fears and go into the doctor and be told, well, why didn't you seek help sooner? Why didn't you seek help this way? Um, it creates such a barrier to seeking care because there's no development of a relationship that will happen. There's no trust that can happen. Um, and I think another issue in that is even going to places which maybe have um, worked really hard to be less racist or sexist or whatever, um, places that don't recognize their own contribution to sexism and racism throughout all of medical history, throughout their recent medical history, can never move past it. Because I think that if you can't name something, you can't fix it. Um, and I think that if, uh, if they can't say, hey, this is what we did wrong, this is what we're going to, going to do to fix it, how can someone coming in know that they even know what's wrong or that they're going to fix it. I think there's a big need for transparency that doesn't exist that prevents um, patients and physicians like attending certain clinics um, and, and opportunities and what have you. Um, I think also additionally that in order to name these things, you need people from the community to name these things. Um, the, that trust, that relationship cannot be developed without people from the community, physicians representing the people that they serve. Um, because there, I really believe that there is no way as someone outside the community to identify all of the things going on in the community, all of the things that affect the community, the ways that they affect the community. Um, uh, one example from trans research is there's so much research on um, transgender people and why they don't seek care. And it's kind of reinventing the wheel. I would say like every, you know, there's there's constantly every year, every couple of years, um, a big national study. Why aren't trans people seeking healthcare? Oh, they're getting misgendered. They're getting mistreated. This is why they're not seeking healthcare. This is the negative outcomes it leads to. Um, but trans people are not involved in creating these studies. They're not involved in vetting the studies. They're not involved in finding the populations that are actually studied. They're relegated to a lower position of power and empowerment um, and as long as we do this research in that way, there's no way to really identify what trans people are going through because they're so actively othered. Um, we can't see what trans people can be in medicine because we aren't letting them be in medicine. Um, uh, an example that comes to mind is that as someone who's openly trans and in medicine um, and has had like specialized training in transgender health and actively seeks gender affirming clinics to receive care, I have never in my life gone to a gender affirming clinic that doesn't have issues with its intake forms, which is such a simple thing, you know, issues with names, with pronouns, with um, asking about gender identity, asking about sexual attraction, asking about sexual health practices, asking about all of the other things that trans people can experience like heart failure and renal disease, and not just asking about them being trans. I mean, these are clinics which people are trained, people are doing the research, but it is not people from the trans community and it shows when you go in. Um, and it's not something that as a patient before being kind of empowered by being a medical student, I was comfortable saying, um, you know, this is one of the few places I could seek care. So it's very hard to say, hey, the care you're giving is not quite right because you're so scared of that care being taken away. Um, and another example that comes to mind on the, the patient side from 
my experience as a provider is I was working last year um, in psych, in pediatric psych, and it was my very first day. And um, I walked into a room, my patient was strapped down and they were screaming and crying. And um, everyone is kind of saying, what happened? You know, this, they don't usually do this. This is not part of their like uh, mental health condition. Um, why are they screaming? Why are they crying? No one could figure it out. And I looked at that patient and I was like, oh my God, this is a trans kid and they're being misgendered. <laughs> And I walked in and I knew it. And afterwards, everyone asked me, how did I know? And I had no way of saying, I, I don't know how I knew. I knew because I'd been through it. I recognized the look on their face. I recognized the tenor of their call. Um, I went up to them and I said, hey, like, what's your name? Um, my name is Davy. These are my pronouns. I'm uh, non-binary. It's really nice to meet you. And I remember they just stopped and stared at me. <laughs> and they were like, I didn't know that trans people can be doctors. Um, definitely thought I was lying at first. <laughs> and it just was like this huge transformation came over them. Um, obviously it's not that extreme for many patient cases, but I saw the difference that just that recognition made that no one else in the room, regardless of how much training they had, were able to recognize, regardless of how well-meaning they are, were able to recognize. Um, so I guess I, I really wanna also like emphasize what Dr. Correa said about raising voices, um, which is so important. And when, when people aren't in the room, um, you still don't have to speak for them. You can still raise the voices of people because there are doctors who are trans, there are doctors who are disabled, who are black, who are Latinx, who've written books and podcasts and recorded panels. Um, there are countless resources where they don't need to be physically present for you to emphasize and raise their voice. Um, and so I think to end, the uh, kind of segregation of physicians to increase diversity, we need to constantly be acting as though we have physicians and patients around us of all identities and recognizing and uplifting that. Thank you so much, Davey. That was um, truly, truly appreciated. And, um, and it, it, so much of what you said just resonated with me. I, I wish we had another hour. Um, so I wanna elevate one question from the, uh, from the group, and this is from Ankush, and I'm sorry, I'm just picking a little bit at random just because of time, and, and I'm going to ask each of our discussants just to take a minute or two, because um, we're almost at the hour, to just give your thoughts. Um, I'm going to simplify the question to, um, how do you deal with systems that turn a blind eye to inequities? So we see that a lot of systems institutions are coming out with statements hiring folks, but what's the difference between doing it in a performative way and really doing the work in your eyes? And what can we as providers do to compel or push our systems in the right direction? So I'll start with Bill and then Ricardo and Davey. Well, Karthik, that's a, an hour long answer, um, the, but I'll focus in on, on one particular element of it. I think because we've used standardized exams, as a way of selecting people for medical school and later for, for residency programs, and then later for board certification, that they play an outsized role in what they're actually able to predict. And if what you're trying to do is figure out how you can be the best physician delivering the best care, the most equitable care, um, to, to engage that altruism that is part of the social contract that medicine has with society, um, I think we should look at different things than the standardized exam. And I think health systems, I think the medical education system, I think we as physicians can all start thinking about why we place so much emphasis on standardized testing when we know that there are strong disadvantages for, for uh, structural disadvantages that uh, prevent uh, certain learners from doing as well in these standardized tests as others. Um, my colleague, Eric Combo, who runs the Milestones program at ACGME would argue that um, of the six competencies that the ACGME advances for education for residents, the only one that even comes close to correlating with your first time pass rate on your uh, specialty certification exam and thus specialty thus, thus, uh, standardized exams in general is medical knowledge. And I would even argue that medical knowledge is becoming a bit outmoded because everybody has a calculator, uh, has a, a computer in their hand uh, with their phone. And you can pull up up to date or whatever other software that you may use to get to your, your diagnosis and synthesis. Um, you, you have to understand that aspect of it 
but I think the, the deep medical knowledge and retention of knowledge with these, with these standardized tests, tests um, is really problematic. And the last thing I'll say is that, that even the makers of the exams have recognized this and that they've now in 2023 will remove the three digit score from USMLE step one so that it correlates with their papers five years ago, six years ago now. Don Melnick was the lead author on that in academic medicine. It was a plea to residency program directors to discontinue the use of standardized exams to determine whether you select a person for an interview for your residency program. Um, I, I think that we as physicians have to move away from that and start thinking about how do we reverse engineer the process to select the best possible physician. Look at what our great physicians do and then go back and figure out what they did before they started medical school and then emphasize those characteristics when we select those students for medical school. Thank you, Bill. Ricardo. Yes, so um, I think I want to focus on the things that we can do for making a change. I think that the most important thing is getting into a leadership position. Do not give away all the passion that you have for this topic and get into a leadership position in your institution, in your organization, and 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 from them, from there, start making uh, the, the, the changes. If it's nothing is happening. Uh, I, I, many, many things is, is for, from a personal point of view, uh, since I arrived, for example, to University of Arizona in Phoenix, I wanted to uh, make these changes in the graduate medical education area. There was a lot of things happening in UME. At the beginning, nobody was paying attention to me, but I didn't quit. That's the thing. I just start continue talking to the leaders. And there was a point that finally, I think that they were tired of me talking about this, that they decided, you know something, let me give you uh, an opportunity. And of course, the opportunity is not just give you a title, but give you a title with power. And that's the main thing. Many times we get a title without power and we cannot make changes. So whenever you get uh, some opportunities that you get a title, ask the title with power or that that can make some, some changes. So after a few years, they, they gave me the opportunity and then I start making some changes. Slowly, I have to fight every day with millions of people that don't think that this is important, but I never give up. So please do not give up in, in this topic. All of here, all of the people here are leaders. And I really believe that all of you are making so many good changes. Focus a lot of that energy in trying to make more changes to be more inclusive. Thank you, Ricardo. And, and Davey, you're going to get the last word. And if it's okay, I'm going to just share a screen because I was supposed to share some resources available um, on our website. Uh, so I'm going to share a screen while you give your comments just so folks can take a look. But uh, I'm going to let you have the last word. Yeah, um, I'll try to be quick. I uh, want to tweak a little bit what Dr. Correa said about everyone being a leader. Um, I think something that has been very helpful for me personally is the mantra that it is not the duty of the oppressed to educate the oppressor. Um, I strongly believe that, I mean, I'm a leader, I'm fulfilled by leadership, this is something I enjoy, but I don't think everyone has to be a leader in the same way. Not everyone is going to be at the top. That's inevitable by the way our system is set up, but it doesn't mean that there aren't things you can do at every level in the system. And I really strongly believe that just existing, like existence is resistance, right? Existence is activism, existing as a black doctor, a trans doctor, a disabled doctor, whatever in medicine is leadership. It is changing and challenging inequities. Um, and I think prioritizing yourself and your ability to get through is crucial um, before you can even think about helping others. It's like putting your own mask on first. Um, you need to protect yourself from like the moral injury that comes from just seeing microaggressions or macroaggressions all the time. You need to protect yourself from the exhaustion that comes from constant activism just by virtue of existing. Um, and I, I want to just point out, like Dr. Abram um, asked a question about competing for resources, um, limited resources amongst minorities. And I think that the biggest way to deconstruct inequity is to make it through and then mentor others. You know, if one person makes it through, they mentor two people. Those two people make it through, they mentor four people. They become the resource. They pass it on. And those resources and the power, it grows exponentially. Um, so that's my suggestion and thoughts. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to all the discussants. I'm just gonna uh, point out that we have recently published our uh, AMA Center for Health Equity uh, Ed Hub webpage where you can find some really great resources. Uh, Bill, ACGME's Equity Matters, also some really great work to take a look at. Um, so pass it back over to Matthew. I want to say thank you 
to every single person um, who was able to present today from um, CHE, from Karthik, thank you for moderating. Dr. McDade, Dr. Correa, student Dr. Ran, you guys are a phenomenal group of people and I feel like I still have so much to learn from each and every single one of you. Um, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, to that point, I want to be respectful of everybody's time and especially the YPS assembly. Um, but I'm going to give my own claps here, um, even though I'm, you know, clapping as one. Um, I know that everyone at home is clapping uh, as well. Thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, best of luck with everything for the rest of the AMA meeting. <laughs>